And my next guess, as Minister of Treaty Negotiations, I think achieved some of the most, or, or brought conclusion to some of the most fought and difficult treaty settlements and um, showed us that sometimes results can be um, surprising if people with perhaps opposing views or apparently opposing, opposing views come together and dialogue with some intellect and some respect. Uh, particularly, I think, the deal with Tuhoi was something he should be uh, very, very proud of. But as an indication, perhaps, that he's out of politics completely, um, former Treaty Negotiations Minister uh, Chris Finlayson has written a book called Yes, Minister, not the most, uh, not the most original title. And I love, whilst I haven't had a chance to um, read it yet, um, my old mate Matthew Hooten has described it as venomous. Venomous. Um, which uh, makes me laugh and want to read the book. We are joined now by Chris Finlayson um, on the line, I'm presuming, from Wellington. Uh, Chris, how are you? Nice to talk with you. Oh, I was up at five o'clock, but uh, fog in Christchurch, so the day is stuffed up. So oh. uh, what better... What better tonic for that frustration than to talk to the great plunker? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I loved, and can I just say, could you talk to your publishers? I would have been someone I thought they would have sent an advanced copy to, Chris. Okay, so just note I for will, your, your I'll, publishers. I'll get on to Alan and Unwin immediately after this call. All right. Um, look, I always... I hate to say it, people have, believe it or not, Chris asked me to write a memoir and I say, A, I have to wait for so many people to die and B, in some ways in my mind, and you're going to tell me I'm wrong, it's like an indication that it's all over when you do the memoir, that the book's written, your life has run its course. I'm sure in your case it hasn't, but what prompted the idea to put all this down in book form? Well, when I left Parliament... Uh, I wanted to write a couple of books first about treaty negotiations simply because I think the National Party's record from the days of Doug and Jim is excellent. Yeah. But you know that most historians are left-wing and they'll airbrush you out. Well, of I mentioned that in the intro. I said there. I think you did yeah. some remarkable work and you carried on some remarkable work. And I yeah, but you get no credit. You said, yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you a story about the Mottendui panels. Um, Dame Anne Salmond wrote a book about the return to New Zealand of treasures that have been lost overseas and the most important of these taonga were the Motunui panels and she managed to write an entire history about the Motunui panels without mentioning who was responsible for getting them back. So that's the left for you. They airbrush you out of history so that's why it's important to uh, get something down in writing. And the second reason is that I wanted to, it's not a um, a memoir as such. It's more of a sketch of my time in, in the National Party from the time I met Keith Holyoke. And it's more of a sketch of my involvement in politics. And so uh, to say it's venomous, I think it's a bit OT. Oh, that's Hooten, Hooten hunting a headline. He was, it was clickbait then, obviously. Um, yeah. Is there anything, and when one, I imagine, embarks on this sort of exercise... And you're doing the sketch. It's not the full-blown uh, Mona Lisa masterpiece. And as a, as a journalist, you decide what to leave out. Is there anything, any story, any anecdote that you really wanted to tell in this book, but someone was alive or your legal brain said that would get me into trouble? Oh, the defamation lawyers took a good look at it. There are a few people I wanted to have a real flick at uh, because um, I thought that they had been very unfair in, in certain circumstances, but um, uh, the lawyers toned it down, which just goes to show uh, the importance of having an external view because the lawyer who acts for himself has a fool for a client. Right. And uh, so it was quite good to have someone say, oh, you better not say that in those terms. Yeah. Would you describe your book as more accurate than Andrea Vance's, what was it called, Blue Bloods thing that is, you know, all the rage well, amongst like the Grayland Liberals at the moment? Oh, yeah, I thought An uh, Andrea's book was very good because it was simply factual uh, and avoided too much comment, and the facts really spoke for themselves. The National Party disgraced itself between 2017 and 2020, and as I'm, when people get in the National Party get shirty with me because I sort of 
have a flick at them, I'd, I say to them, well, basically, you guys don't own the party. You're the stewards of a great political tradition. And I first became active in the National Party in 1975. And it's my party as much as it is yours. And you have a responsibility to preserve the brand of the National Party and what you did between 2017 and 2020 was shameful and you let people down. If you don't like that, well, that's bad luck. Yeah. You say between 2017 and 2020, what happened in 2020 to stop the party from being shameful? Well, I think that uh, basically Judith had to uh, I think she probably had the ultimate hospital pass uh, and limited the damage, uh, but um, I think that 2021, with a new uh, broom taking over, I personally think Luxon's going to do a very good job. I've known Willis for years, and she's ex extremely bright. Uh, and I think when you see and hear uh, about who's thinking of nominating for uh, Parliament, I think the National Party's picked itself up from the canvas pretty well. Uh, and if they focus on the issues that concern people, uh, crime, uh, I think, is uh, number one. The misery index about uh, are people any happier today than they were six years ago? Well, demonstrably, the answer is no. Uh, if they run the, the Ronald Reagan misery index line, they can do themselves um, a lot of good. Mm. Uh, Chris, I'd also say that there are other issues out there which you have taken particular stands on. One of them is the co-governance issue, and let's, let's not dress it up whether or not is it, it is acceptable to, if you like, tap into the rich vein of, if you like, casual racism that exists in this country, and whether or not it is acceptable. And, and your, I always think your, your perspective on this is interesting because of your role as Treaty Negotiations Minister. There are a lot of New Zealanders who have concern about co-governance and have deep concern about the area, the significance which the Treaty of Waitangi has over 20 or 30 years come to play in our public service, in our court system, in our systems of laws and in our constitutional arrangements. Um, people who do raise questions about that are most often described increasingly by a biased mainstream media as racists. And I've watched you with interest on, on this issue in the last year or two. You seem to be saying those discussions are, might not always be legitimate. Oh, no, I think that, um, you see, I have enormous time for David Seymour. I think, think he's an excellent member of Parliament uh, and uh, someone who's going to play a significant role in the government of New Zealand from t uh, in the years ahead. But I think that he is perfectly within his rights to say, right, well, uh, the national uh, government that I supported introduced uh, co-governance in the context of treaty settlements or treaty partnerships for natural resources, and we can understand the rationale for that. But with these extensions, is it legitimate? Let's have a debate about that. David's not racist. He's being an opposition politician, and he's raising important questions. And uh, I, I have no problem with that at all. Do you think but then, the again, current trajectory? The, do you think the current trajectory on co-governance? Um, Willie Jackson's uh, comments that he'd like to tweak democracy, or we need to tweak democracy. Do you think we are well, heading in the right direction, or are we heading to conflict? And are we heading well, away from one person, one vote? Well, I think there are always going to be these sorts of issues. Um, Dear old Willie's inclined to indulge in the argument by epithets so of someone takes a different view, they're slammed as racist, and that's designed, of course, to shut down debate. But I doubt whether they'll shut down uh, people like uh, Seymour on those sorts of issues. But the, the, the questions you raise, that's for the current generation of politicians. I'm just sort of a washed-up nobody now. All I try and do is set out the, uh, the principled origin of co-governance, say that it is not co-government, that there's one sovereign in this country, uh, but there are legitimate areas for uh, increasing involvement of iwi, and I've referred to 
for example, you talked about the Tuhori settlement uh, or the Wanganui, uh, the Wanganui River, the Waikato River, with natural resources, I think that there is a very legitimate role for greater iwi involvement. And if it's explained uh, to people, they tend to agree. Yeah, I, explaining it to people is, is, is the hard part. And as someone who personally would describe himself as liberal, I still find some of this abhorrent to my... Uh, natural feelings about democracy and uh, equality uh, before the law. Um, Chris, you describe yourself as, you know, a has-been or washed up. You're not at all. Don't you really, given your experience uh, and given your longevity, have still have an important role to play in giving some context to the decisions that the latest generation of National Party politicians might make? Oh, yeah, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm a term limits man, you do your thing, uh, you dance across the stage for as long as the people want you there, but when the curtain comes down, you move on, there's nothing sadder than, and it often happened with me, these former politicians would come into your office and they were clearly looking for, for jobs or status or honours, I mean, eventually you just move on and, and not give a toss about what happens and that's the way I feel, although I wanted to set out where I was coming from in my time as a minister, uh, give credit to people I think did a very good job. Uh, John Key joked to someone the other day when he read read the book and read reviews, he said to someone, doesn't Finlayson realise I can't hand out honours anymore? Uh, why, is he, why does he keep praising me? Well, the answer is obvious. He was a damn good Prime Minister and ran an excellent government. Yeah, and that was, I mean, the last heyday of, of the National Party, Chris, wasn't it? Chris, I want to ask you, you have always struck me media-wise and as a journalist, and that's fundamentally... Our relationship is one of a journalist and a minister or an active politician. The great thing about you is you'd always get back uh, to me and if you weren't going to front, you had nothing to say. You say, I've got nothing to say, I'm not going to front. It was a clear, ambiguous message. If you did front up to the news media, you always had something to say or you had a point to make, so I wasn't wasting my time. I think the nature of the relationship between politicians and the media and the media themselves have changed greatly since I would have first met you. Do you have any observations, particularly on the way our press gallery behaves or our political journalists behave and do their job at present? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm very worried about the fact that so many of them seem to be in thrall um, uh, of the government because of funding issues. Um, and so there's that concern. There are other outlets like stuff, I complained to Annie at King once, I said I've never had a decent story from stuff, and whether it's that guy Crudson who can be a nasty piece of works or others, I don't know, but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, stuff is, and the Dominion Post for example, is just fundamentally left wing, mind you Annie had said they never said anything nice about me either, but I don't know if that's right, so um, there are some papers that will not uh, report the full story and go easy on the current government. Well, I'm going to give you an example that we've been talking about here on the platform today. A uh, public interest journalism-funded documentary was made by a woman called Paula Penfold for Stuff, and she was on government-funded Radio New Zealand yesterday morning on Media Watch, explaining why she did not bother interviewing any of the people she criticised in her documentary because she decided she'd talk to experts and that was too dangerous. Um, it seems to me we've lost a certain amount of impartiality in our, in our media, if we ever had it. Or am I dreaming back to a... Does my memory fail me? Was there never a golden age of unbiased journalists who would try and get all sides of a story? Oh, I think you're absolutely right, and isn't that <clears throat> really what I was just saying a few minutes ago? I think there are some journalists who approach things from a fundamentally left-wing view, uh, and so you will not get a story. That's why stuff is fundamentally left-wing, and you could never get a fair hearing from them, which is another reason why I wanted to record in my little book uh, some of my, my dealings with stuff journalists. They were just always out to sneer at you or to paint me as a cold, remote, misanthropic sort of a guy. Um, that, that, that is the way they go about things because that's their worldview and they're enthralled to the left. 
All right, I can't ask you to do any better than that for our next promo clip, uh, Chris, I really can't. Um, how is the book selling? Of course you're going to get the Plunkett bump now that we've mentioned it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have no idea, but you really should write a book. I mean, I enjoyed the Treaty Settlements one, but this was, re it's really as designed as a bit of a light-hearted jaunt. I talk about some of the cases I was involved in when I was a young person, and I'd always wanted to tell the story of when I had to prosecute Jerry Wall, the former speaker, over his builder's sheet, which he wouldn't demolish, because it was a genuinely funny story in my view. So uh, I think you've, given your wealth of experience and your brilliance as a journalist, you should be able to write something, uh, Sean, so you really should. Yeah, but the question is, can you walk down the street uh, unmolested after that? Chris Finlayson, thank you so much for your time this morning. It is always a delight talking with you. And uh, where is the book available? Uh, well, I'm sure it's All good bookstores. That's the, the answer all for that, Chris, and all good bookstores. <laughs> and you don't know the price, but it's reasonably priced, and it's called Yes, yes Minister? Yes, indeed. Yeah, can I just say the title sucks? The title sucks. How unoriginal. Well, well, I wanted I wanted to use the Churchill quote of uh, "on tap but not on top," which is a reference to lawyers. But Alan and Unwin thought it was pornographic, so we didn't go there. See, if I used a Churchill quote for my memoir, it'd be "Yes, but in the morning I shall be sober." <laughs> or in the morning I'll be sober. That's it. We've just named my memoir. Chris, thanks so much, yeah. mate. We'll catch up soon. That is Chris Finlayson, and the former Attorney General, Minister of uh, Treaty Settlements, uh, lawyer. And look, one of the people I've enjoyed coming across in my life as a journalist and uh, in, in politics, very arch. So his book is out. It is called, and we're not getting paid for this, actually. I just like, I'm going to read it, even though they didn't send me an advanced copy. It's called Yes, Minister by Chris Finlayson, and it will be in all good bookstores. Uh, what do you think of what Chris had to say?